Are you reading machine learning research papers or deep learning research papers and you just feel like you're getting stuck? I know how you feel. I recently started reading a bunch of machine learning and deep learning research papers, but one thing that I noticed was that things really just weren't sinking in. It didn't feel like I was picking stuff up fast enough, I was getting confused by mathematical notation, and there were concepts which were really abstract to me. So what I ended up doing is I ended up continuously reading a bunch of papers until I developed a little bit of a process. Now this process might not be perfect, but it will help you get up to speed and really process these research papers a whole lot faster and ideally, fingers crossed, help you from losing your mind. So the first thing that I want you to do is take a deep breath and reset your expectations. Woo. A key thing about approaching deep learning and machine learning research papers is that they are inherently quite sophisticated and quite complex. Now don't expect to approach the YOLO research paper or attention is all you need and be able to master it in about five minutes. Keep in mind that these research papers have been written over years by teams of amazing computer scientists and deep learning engineers at top tier tech companies. So resetting your expectations and really understanding that it's gonna take a little bit of time to get through this research paper is going to make the whole process a whole lot smoother and a whole lot painless. Not necessarily painless, but ideally a little less painful. So now that our mind is all clear and fresh, the next thing that we wanna do is read the abstract, the conclusion, take a look at the data section and take a look at the results section. The importance of reading the abstract cannot be understated. The abstract is the section right at the top of the paper that usually gives you a high level summary of the entire paper. It normally explains what's novel, new or interesting about the paper, whether or not it achieves interesting results or high level results, whether or not it's a new way of doing a particular thing, whether or not it's completely tackling a task which has never been seen before. Reading the abstract is really gonna set you up for success because it's gonna give you an overview or a bird's eye view of the entire paper. Once you've gone and read the abstract, the next thing that you wanna go on ahead and do is take a look at the conclusion. The conclusion usually goes into a little bit of additional detail over and above the abstract and really starts to explain the results that the authors achieved within the particular paper and within their research. And most importantly, it starts to set the scene for how this particular model may be improved in the future. So it's a great project that you could potentially add to your resume if you wanted to extend. And it also explains what they're planning on doing to actually improve that model. So it sort of sets the scene for some additional research that you might wanna take a look into. Now, once you've read the abstract and the conclusion, you wanna go back and take a look at the data section and the results. Taking a look at the data section really sets the scene for what types of information are going to be required for this particular model to work effectively. It also starts to explain or gives you an idea as to how you might actually use this model and take it into production. Sometimes you're going to need a bunch of different types of data, you're gonna to need to perform a bunch of different types of augmentation. So knowing this upfront really helps identify how you might be able to go and approach this model. I think the results is also a really interesting section to read because it starts to identify how this particular model works against certain benchmarks, but also against other models which may be popular out there in the field. So going through and reading the abstract, the conclusion, the data section, and the results is going to give you a bird's eye overview of the paper in its entirety. So we've now got a reasonable overview of what this entire paper is all about. We've read the abstract, we've taken a look at the conclusion, and we've started to understand what data is required and why this particular model may be performing better than others. Now, the next thing that I've actually found that makes this process a ton easier is to double check whether or not the code and data is available. Having the code and data available is going to make your life a ton easier. Let's face it, the main process or the main reason that you're actually going through this paper is ideally to be able to truly understand it, try it out yourself or build it up from scratch so that you can apply it to your own use case. Having the code and the data that the authors use is going to make this process a billion times easier. So you want to double check whether or not this is going to be available right at the get-go. Now, I'm not gonna lie, I've gone through a couple of papers and they haven't actually provided the code or the data. 
Now, unless that particular paper is so new, so novel, or so interesting, more often than not, I'm probably gonna drop it to the wayside because it's gonna be so much more difficult to actually try to get an understanding of that. Now, there are going to be use cases where you wanna go and build it from scratch and maybe the author hasn't provided the code, but more often than not, this is the exception, not the rule. Now, if a particular paper doesn't actually come with the code or data, the best place to actually go and have a look for it is to go to papers with code. The amazing thing about this particular website is you're going to be able to see a whole bunch of top performing research papers within that field, but more often than not, they'll actually link to examples or samples of that code that you're able to pick up and use yourself. Doing this is gonna make your life a billion times easier, particularly when you've got really tricky or niche components within that particular model that you wanna build up. The fourth step in the process of understanding machine learning and deep learning research papers is to isolate how the model was built and trained. You're probably reading the research paper because you wanna identify and understand what actually makes a difference. Right? So going through these steps is going to help you do exactly that. Now, what I found after going through a bunch of research papers is there's a couple of key things that you really wanna call out that's gonna help solidify your understanding of that particular paper. The first thing that you wanna take a look at is the model architecture. Almost every deep learning or machine learning research paper is going to have an architecture diagram. Whatever you do, Highlight, circle that, make a big note of it because it's going to help you understand the flow throughout the model. This brings us to the second thing that you want to take a look at. What are the inputs of the model and what are the outputs? Understanding whether or not there's multiple inputs, whether or not there needs to be data transformations applied to your data, understanding whether or not the data is applied at different steps within the model is really going to help you understand how it all fits together. Understanding the outputs is going to help you understand what you're actually expecting out of this model. Are there multiple outputs? So say, for example, if you take a look at the YOLO model, there's multiple prediction heads. Are there different probabilities that you're going to be getting back? What does the output actually look like? Are you going to be getting probabilities? Are you going to be getting a segmentation map? Is it going to be a series of tokens? Understanding what the input looks like and understanding what the output looks like helps really clarify what the model is doing. The next thing that you wanna take a look at is whether or not there's any new or novel layers. If you actually take a look at the paper titled All You Need Is Attention, what you'll notice is that there's a new layer in there which is what everybody was talking about, which is called multi-head attention. Understanding whether or not there's new or different layers really is going to help you later on when it actually comes to taking a look at the code. Because more often than not, you'll see that a large portion of the code is allocated to dealing with these new or novel interactions that are going to be available within your model. The next thing that you want to take a look at, particularly if you're looking at deep learning models, is how is loss calculated. Normally you're gonna have a really detailed mathematical formulation for that particular loss function. What you wanna do is make a note of that and actually take a look at how they've gone and implemented it in the code. This is really, really important. Understanding the inputs, the outputs, the architecture, the loss, whether or not there's any new or novel layers is really gonna help you understand what's actually happening when it comes to read the code. So it's sort of like meshing the theory and the practice together to really understand what on earth is happening? The last thing that you wanna take a look at is how was the model actually trained? Was there something really specific as part of the training implementation? What was the batch size? What were the hyperparameters being used? Understanding these is really going to help you when it comes to actually training and implementing this particular model. Now, normally what I'll actually do when it comes to actually understanding these components is I'll actually use my iPad and actually annotate a particular paper using an app called GoodNotes. Now, the reason that I use GoodNotes is that you can actually write on the paper itself. So you can actually highlight certain components of the code, you can write notes on that particular paper and you can actually come back to them. Now, the reason that I write on the paper is that when I come back to the paper, which inevitably I'll have to because I normally go through a couple of key passes of a particular paper. It helps me understand what components I already understood, what were my particular notes for that model, and it really helps me to restart from where I left off rather than having to restart completely from scratch when it comes to understanding the model. If you don't have an iPad or if you don't wanna actually write on it on iPad, what I also found was that writing it on the paper itself, so printing it out, 
highlighting, writing notes on the paper, that was just as effective. Now, the other thing that you wanna take a note of is as you're actually going through and identifying how the model was trained and built, is to make notes of components that you don't actually understand. Have a list of questions for things that you might need to clarify a little bit later or you might need to do some more research into. This is completely normal. Often research papers build on top of other research papers. So those papers are sort of like assumed knowledge. Having a list of papers or a list of other resources that you might need to read is going to help you accelerate a whole heap faster when it comes to actually dealing with this particular paper. Now, the fifth and final step when it comes to really getting your head around research papers is to try it out. I've kind of been alluding to this throughout the entire video but actually going through and doing more than just reading the paper is going to help you truly understand the model. This is the core reason that I called out double check whether or not the code and the actual data for this particular model is available. Because when it comes to truly understanding the model, actually testing, trying it out and extending it is going to help solidify your knowledge a whole heap faster. Now I'm currently working through the Facenet model developed by the Google team and what I actually found is by coding through a little bit of it each and every day, sort of like Kenji's 66 days of data, you're going to be able to build up your knowledge and actually really and truly get to grips with what the model is doing, how it works and what the performance metrics are like. Additionally, something that I also picked up as part of going through this is having an understanding of how to create custom layers, how to build and develop your own loss metrics. These are things which are really, really important, particularly if you wanna get into deep learning research. Being able to do these things is gonna help you a long way. Now, I'm at the moment working this through using the Keras functional API, or the TensorFlow Keras functional API, which makes it a whole heap easier. But if you're using PyTorch, again, Take a look at how you can do different things. This includes creating custom layers, developing your own loss functions, applying those loss functions to your model. So taking a look at back propagation in a little bit more detail. The core thing is whatever you do, make sure you go on ahead and actually try out the model for yourself. This is really gonna accelerate your knowledge for that particular paper or for that particular implementation way faster than anything else. Thanks so much for tuning in guys. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to give it a like, hit subscribe and tick that bell so you get notified of when I've released future videos. And if you've got any other tips and tricks that you use to actually go on ahead and read machine learning or deep learning research papers, do let me know in the comments below. I'm always eager to hear what you're using to get up to speed a whole heap faster. Thanks again for tuning in. Peace.